Um, hello, Eric. How are you? I'm doing fine, Jack. How are you? Just great. For those of you who are watching us, I'm Jack Balkin. I teach constitutional law at Yale Law School. And I'm Eric Posner. I teach at the University of Chicago Law School, although at the moment I'm visiting at NYU Law School. And I hope you're enjoying yourself. <laughs> I am very much, thanks. So, Jack, what should we talk about? Well, we have a number of things to talk about. One is there is a new administration in town, I hear. Uh, and it's so am I. Yeah, and it, it'll have effects on the federal judiciary, on the court system, on constitutional issues. So I thought we'd talk about first our predictions about the likely effects of the new administration on the, the courts and the courts on the new administration. Okay. Why don't you start with some predictions? Well, uh, so I assume that we're probably on the same page about what we think is likely to happen in Supreme Court appointments, that most of the people who are likely to retire will be the liberals. Is this not true? That's true. And that might be, that would be Justice Stevens, perhaps, perhaps Justice Ginsburg, uh, and possibly Justice Souter, although we don't know. That's what I've heard. And of the conservatives, perhaps the oldest would be Justice Scalia, do you think? Uh, you would know better than I, but that sounds right. He's right. in the 70s, I think. Yeah. yeah. So the most likely combination of appointments would be replacing liberals with uh, appointments by a Democratic president who would also be liberal. So you don't really change the ideological balance of the court all that much. That's right. But I guess a big question is whether he's going to... Um, uh, whether he's going to change, um, he, he's going to appoint people who are more technocratic or more uh, ideological right. as replacements. Yes, what, yes. what do you think? Uh, my suspicion is that he will uh, probably uh, produce more briars than uh, Thurgood Marshalls. And, and why, why is that? Uh, that's, of, that's, of course, what, what Clinton did also. Why don't the Democrats... Why don't Democratic presidents want to appoint uh, more ideological Supreme Court justices the way the, the Republicans do? Well, actually, they, they used to once, once many years mm -hmm. ago, as the example of Thurgood Marshall suggests. I think it's because the Democratic Party now is not centrally focused on any particular social movement, as the Republican Party has been uh, really since Reagan. Um, when, when a social movement is a key player in a party or dominates the party or basically shapes its direction, then that social movement tends to produce appointees who are more ideological or at least agree with the basic tenets of the social movement. And that's what we see in the Republican Party really since the Reagan administration. I think of the, the presidents that using um, Supreme Court appointments as an as a opportunity to to make payoffs, you know, sometimes they might be patronage-style payoffs yeah. or rewarding people like uh, the, the Harriet Myers attempt, and then sometimes it's to reward or to provide support or make a payoff to um, important uh, supporters. And, and the Obama administration, at least at the moment, is shaping up to be a kind of centrist-seeming uh, administration, which, of course, is disappointing uh, a lot of the very a lot of the very important supporters on the left, and and wouldn't a wouldn't a, a left you know an ideological uh, left leaning Supreme Court justice be a, a great opportunity to uh, to to uh, to you know to soothe some some hurt feelings? Yes, it could be a kind of pleasing of constituencies. And you're right. Very often, when presidents choose Supreme Court appointees, they're 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 balancing lots of different combinations of considerations. One, of course, is who did you promise things to and what constituencies do you have to please and what demographic groups do you have to be concerned about? And then the other thing, which is, is true of presidents, is what Sandy Levinson and I call partisan entrenchment. That is, you're trying to entrench a certain set of policy views or constitutional views for the foreseeable future. And, and I think that will certainly be important to the Obama administration. But the thing that's interesting and the thing that's worth talking about is what kinds of views would the Obama administration really want to entrench? That is, what Oh, that was what I was exactly going to ask you. So, yeah, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, some of them I think will be quite surprising. Uh, I think that, for example, um, I'm not sure that the Obama administration wants to entrench people who are deeply skeptical of executive power even mm -hmm. though many people in the Democratic Party have been skeptical of, Democrat, of executive power, for example, me, uh, for some time. 
I don't think that's his agenda. I think he'll probably look for people who are strong on civil rights, as liberals understand those questions, uh, who are more or less uh, believe in relatively strong federal power and national power. Uh, but that doesn't carry with it um, necessarily a strong skepticism about executive power. Well, it could, though. Don't you think, uh, let's say, somebody with, with strong civil rights instincts would be would would be um, would be skeptical of the w sorts of war on terror policies that the Bush administration has implemented, and that I assume now I'm going to try to say something controversial that the o Obama administration is going to carry carry on. Do you think isn't that the case? Yes, but uh, the o but much of what's going to happen, I predict, the courts won't really have much of an opportunity to countermand since it's my guess that much of what the Obama administration will do in the area of executive power is just dial things back one notch. So, Jack, uh, what, what constitutional issues do you think will arise in the executive branch? Well, I think for one thing, we'll have to pay very close attention to how the administration implements the new FISA Amendments Act of 2008. Okay, can you, can you explain that for, for our viewers so everybody knows what that means? Right. So. There was a big controversy, as you may remember, over the, uh, the over the domestic surveillance program uh, that was run by the National uh, Security Agency, and there was a big fight over it. And then in 2007, Congress passed a, a patch-up bill that basically tidied the controversy over for a while. And in 2008, they passed the FISA Amendments Act, which really revamps the rules regarding surveillance, electronic surveillance, and uh, it really uh, gives enormously new, enormous new powers to the executive, and it decreases judicial oversight. Now you have oversight of the entire program, whereas before you had judicial oversight of requests for surveillance of individuals. The, the bill is very opaque, and the parts that aren't opaque are vague. And so mm -hmm. a lot of it will depend on how the executive chooses to implement it. Okay. And, and we, you know, knowing little else, we, we might assume that the executive will approach this statute in a somewhat more restrained way than, than the Bush administration. Is that what you think they're going to do, or, or do you think it'll be the same? I think it'll be somewhat more restrained because I think that it, it's not even a question of restrained, more restrained, less restrained. It's really sort of a question about issues of design. Um, are you going to design a bunch of checks within the executive branch? Are you going to in institute various ways for information to flow so that if something is going wrong, people can know it and correct it? And I think that in the Bush administration, I think partly it was due to a relative skepticism about oversight by other branches, and part it was due to the idea that there's a great urgency to get things done and to solve the problem of terrorism. I think the Obama administration is going to have a slightly different take because we're now eight years away from 9-11. And... You need to put in yeah. place things that are going to work over a long period of time. Won't the Obama administration, though, be devastated if there's a terrorist attack and, and it comes up afterwards that, um, you know, there were, there were restraints put on agents and which, which restricted surveillance? Indeed, but, but just, since... Just the way there but, was before 9-11. Wouldn't that be devastating to them? In, are they going to indeed, risk that? Indeed, but... Indeed, but I should say that no matter what restraints are placed on them, and there were restraints in the Bush administration, they would have been devastated if there turned out to be a terrorist attack. That is, if there's another terrorist attack in the United States, uh, both you and yeah, I know, it, both you yeah, and I know yeah. that all bets are off, that there'll be a, a really significant rethinking and re-arguing of the debates we've had over surveillance in the last seven or eight years. Why? That why? why? I mean, why is that the case? Do you think that it makes it sound like you think that the the real basis of the debates we've been having is just an empirical dispute about the likelihood that another terrorist attack occurs? So, if another terrorist attack occurs, liberals will say to conservatives, "Well, you were right. Uh, you know, now we're gonna we're gonna get rid of whatever restraints are left." And if it never occurs, eventually the conservatives will give in to the liberals and, and go the opposite direction. Do you think it's just an empirical disagreement, or that there's a real ideological disagreement going on here? I, you know, you use the word "you're empirical" here. I'm not sure I would call it an empirical disagreement. I'd call it a framing agreement, a, 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 a disagreement about how you frame the nature of the situation. And mm -hmm. I think it often has to do with with uh, like what you would call the availability ability heuristic, right? In other words, the things that are close in time to you and 
and salient to you shape uh, how you frame situation and the things that are distant in time from you and don't seem very likely also frame what you think is going on. And I think mm-hmm. that I think that if there's another terrorist attack, which is successful as opposed to the ones that have been prevented in the last eight years, which we don't know about but have been prevented, I think that'll that'll just change everybody's framing of the situation. Yours also. I mean, you know, n- knowing about the the hazards of the availability heuristic, are you going to change your views? Or, or are I you, are I you hope I do not maintain them. I hope I do ah, not. Okay. But but I uh, you know this is. Philip Sober talking about Philip Drunk. <laughs> I think you don't give yourself enough credit. I think you can maintain uh, consistency even if another attack occurs. Well, but, thank you very much. But, we'll have another conversation. Yeah. God forbid that should happen. We'll have another conversation, and you'll see. You'll see. You'll see the tremor in my face, and you'll see my <laughs> eyes wide open, and the, you okay, know we'll play back the, the high pitch in my voice. Yes. Yeah. But in any case, do, do you think? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. One, one of the, one of the, you know, just to to to, to put this at a more uh, at a higher level of abstraction, one of the, you know, people have been berating the Bush administration for eight years now for violating the Constitution, you know, dis- disregarding important constitutional values, uh, disregarding civil liberties, and, and, and so on and so forth. Now, my view about this is that you know, some of this is correct, okay, but a lot of it is partisan. That is to say, people. Um, are seizing right. upon controversial policies that they disagree with and characterizing them as, as crimes or legal errors when, in fact, it's just a policy disagreement. Mm-hmm. And and now we have this big test, and at least some people, I don't know whether I agree with this, but some people say, well, you know, now uh, Obama's supporters are backing off a little bit and, and not and not, um, at least some of them maybe, and are not, and are sort of backing off of a little bit and saying, well, you know, these are policy disagreements that we're going to have to think about. What, what, what do you think? It, 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 was the Bush administration criminal? Or was it just that they took aggressive views that uh, the Obama administration may well uh, justifiably choose to take as well? Uh, as well? Okay. Um, you're, there are a lot of things wrapped up in your answer. Let me give you two very quick conclusions, then we'll talk about them, but... Um, the other thing to think about is the very important idea you just put forward, which is that when administration change and party control changes, then people tend to flip on structural arguments like presidential mm-hmm. power versus so congressional power and judicial power. And I think that is very frequent. By the way, the fact that that happens isn't necessarily a bug. It's a feature of our system. So that when you have shifts of power, there's somebody out there who is defending the institutional prerogative of the other branch. So the Republicans mm-hmm. will start defending the institutional prerogatives now of the, judi- of the judiciary and uh, and and Congress, um, and the administ- and now the Democrats will start defending the institutional prerogatives of the president. Not surprising, right. and that and that probably yeah. is part of the way that that uh, separation of powers is supposed to work. It's supposed to harness partisanship for public ends. But yeah, you but, and but, I, but objective are, people, yes, like us, exactly. But academics, you and I are because, academics, and we're not yeah. supposed to be yeah. involved. In, in purely right. partisan exercise, we're supposed to judge what's the best rules. Uh, Absolutely. So that's what that's our job. Our job is to mm-hmm. is to say whether or not there's a Democrat or Republican in office. Let's assess what's the right balance of presidential power versus um, a judicial power. What degree of oversight do we need? Okay. So let's right. go back to your uh, your your first question, which is, did they do anything that could be labeled criminal? I can think of two things they did that could have been labeled criminal. Whether or not they will lead to prosecutions is really anybody's guess, and we can talk about that. One is mm-hmm. the uh, violation of FISA, that even though Congress has ratif- uh, changed FISA twice, in 2007 and then 2008, uh, in order to allow the president to have more room, uh, the president probably violated FISA uh, repeatedly in the run-up to those changes. And so that mm-hmm. would be technically criminal. and. If you thought that uh, you know it was worth prosecuting, yeah, there would be plenty of reason to think that that, that had violated the law, and the president ordering mm-hmm. it had violated the law, and the subordinates had violated the law. Right? That's number one. There might be defenses. You might have the defense that uh, if you were told to do this, uh, and the OLC had signed off on it, that's a good defense. That's a possible defense. That's one well. set of issues. Here's the other set. The Bush administration, as you know, engaged in various detention interrogation practices. In my opinion, those detention interrogation practices probably violated the anti-torture statute. 
and they pro they might well have violated the war crime statute before it was amended in uh, 2006. Uh, however, when the when the administration pushed through the Military Commissions Act in 2006, they retroactively absolved themselves for criminal liability. Uh, so mm-hmm. there might not be any domestic criminal liability, and of course, the, if the OLC blessed it, there might be a good defense, but there might be violations of international law. And if you, and I know you have general skepticism here, but if you thought that uh, international law is viable in bringing people to justice, as it has in other cases and contexts, you might think that there, there are war crimes problems. Now, all that is just, you know, you're asking me, read the statute, what does it say, right? There are, right, there, right. There are lots of prudential mm-hmm. considerations that we'd have to address in addition. Well, let's talk about the prudential uh, but, uh, considerations, but I want to I disagree with you a little bit, just because I'm going to take a different perspective here, not because I parse the statutes differently. But it seems to me that whether they committed crimes or not it has got to be endogenous. And I mean it in the following way, that, that the political s- system somehow is going to come to a decision about whether these, this was criminal activity. Mm-hmm. The, the, the legal materials don't get us very far because the the claim of the Bush administration all along was that the president's powers under Article Two of the Constitution are whatever, more or less infinite. I don't know, very very broad. Yeah, very in times hardly of emergency. limited at all. We might say very very broad in times of emergency. But but right. the point is about that is you know there's that's just you know the sort of constitutional argument that people have been making for. 200 years about the presidency or about Congress or about the authority of the mm-hmm. Supreme Court or the meaning of the First Amendment, and it's up in the air like all uh, constitutional arguments. And it could be that there are trials and people are convicted and, and go to jail, and at that point I would say, okay, you know, I, I concede that there's, there's a constitutional precedent or there's, a, you know, kind of a quasi-political legal precedent now, you know, like in Nuremberg, right. which establishes that this behavior is criminal. Mm-hmm. And if nothing happens, either for prudential reasons or because trials are held and juries won't convict, uh, then uh, then that would suggest that the Bush administration did not act in a criminal way. Well, then can I give you a very specific instance, and then we can we can use that to talk about the endogeneity issue. So, Section okay. uh, 28 U.S.C. Section um, uh, 2440, I think it is the A is the torture statute. And the torture statute makes it a crime to engage in torture. And there's also the McCain Amendment that makes it illegal to engage in cruel and humane and degrading treatment. And um, so we also have the admission by the administration that it had ordered waterboarding at various points. And we also have uh, we also evidence of the use of uh, torture uh, or a torture light or whatever you want to call it uh, in um, the way in which people were detained. And we have lots of evidence about that. Now, there are two arguments that, uh, and I don't know which one you're making. One is that actually it turns out that there's a real debate as to whether or not any of this stuff violated the actual statutes. That's a statutory claim. Right. The not second, making that argument. You are not making that argument? Not making that okay. argument. The second yeah, I mean, claim is... Maybe it's true. Yeah, it's the second claim argument. is that yeah. the, the claim that, that appears in the torture memos, which is that when the president acts in his, in his, um, in his position as commander-in-chief, in his role as commander in chief, he can't be bound by statutes like the torture, anti torture statute, or the McCain Amendment. That he may disregard mm-hmm. them because they're unconstitutional as applied to his actions when taken mm-hmm. as commander in chief. What do you think of that argument? Well, I, yeah, I mean, it's it's an aggressive argument, and it's and and they're not you know there are not many clear precedents for it, but the the presidents have been making claims that um, in in times of war they're they're not constrained by statutes, and mm-hmm. it's open to a president to, to even to initiate this claim for the first time. That's how constitutional change occurs. Right. And, um, but that's, and if it's but accepted. That's from the outside If it's accepted. So I'm asking you as an insider, as a participant oh, in the system, personally? do you believe mm-hmm. that do you believe that the president, the best argument is the president can disregard the torture statute and disregard uh, features of, of law, American law that say that he can't torture or engage in cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment. My position is, until the law changes, that the president doesn't have that power and that if he violated those laws, he would be subject to criminal penalty unless there was some defense. Uh, what's your view? Well, when you say until the law changes, I mean, in my view, the law changes the moment the public or whoever the relevant agents are 
come to believe that the president has that power. Do you believe and the president I, I, has and that I, power? I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not trying to evade your, an, your answer. I understand. But I'll, I'll get to but But just it seems to me that, you know, if, if this goes forward, you see what I'm trying to say? That when you say until the law changes, the way the law changes is not, is not through a constitutional amendment. That's very rare. The law changes through a gradual change in public sentiment and, this, and the sentiment of, of especially of elites and the, and the people with power. Now, in, in terms of what my opinion is, I think it's a tough question. It's a matter of what, I, what you might call constitutional policy. Mm -hmm. you know, what's the best type of constitution we should have? Should we have constitutional rules that release the president, or I'm sorry, that prevent Congress from restricting the power of the president to deal with certain types of crises? Right. Okay. And, and I think that in general, the answer is, um, you know, yeah, yes, but, uh, but, but everything, you know, depends on the details. What type of crisis, you know, is it a, is it a, is it a serious threat? Is it a, is it a moderate threat? Mm -hmm. And I don't think that you can evaluate the Bush administration simply on the basis of formal legal materials like, like the statutes, but the statutes in light of this of one's view about constitutional policy, which, it, at least in my mm -hmm. case, means a certain amount of freedom for the president to use uh, discretion in responding to threats. Now, yes, um, I, I understand. And so yeah. the difference between us is I think that, assuming that, in fact, the, the meaning of torture is what I think it means, uh, and the evidence is what I think it is, the president clearly violated the law, and then the question for me is, what do you do about it? Whereas for you, the question is, I'm not sure the president has violated the law because maybe the torture statute under these conditions is unconstitutional. Right, right. 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 And, and, and I'm surprised that you take your view. because I mean, it seems to me, but, you know, maybe, maybe I just don't understand, you know, I, I misunderstand your, your general constitutional views, which... Uh, are embodied Maybe in I don't understand my work, general but, constitutional views, but anyway, go well, ahead. But, Why is it surprising? Yeah, but it seems to me view? that, uh, that uh, well, uh, surprise might be too strong. But you know, go back to any type of uh, you know development in constitutional law. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a little confused because you you also call yourself a kind of an originalist. But but going back to a pre-originalist version of, of your thinking, or the post-originalist version. Yeah. Go yeah, ahead. Constitution. Yeah, I know. It's it's a you know you, your views are anyway. I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. But the constitutional law evolves through in in, in part people violating the rules. Well, constitutional right. law uh, evolves my favorite through people making claims on the constitution which they regard to be the correct interpretations. Well, or they say or they say you know they say they think it's right and 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 people eventually acquiesce because it makes sense because they agree they're persuaded and so what we're doing right now is in miniature having a dispute mm -hmm. about what's the proper way to interpret the constitution now when you do that you are obliged to make the best arguments you can think of to persuade the other person mm -hmm. which is right. what I understand you to be doing with me right. and I'm trying to tell you that I think that given my views about the constitution and what the president can do and can't do, that although the president has lots of elbow room, he has lots of room to act in emergencies, if Congress says, pass the statute saying you can't commit war crimes and you can't torture, that they can bind him to that. Right. And that if he violates and those laws, then he is subject to whatever punishments they see fit to bring against him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, there mm -hmm. may be reasons why they don't bring punishments against them, but my view, in some sense, is not that different from Lincoln's. Lincoln's view was that it was very interesting because Lincoln's view said you have to be transparent about what you're doing. You have to say, I'm going to violate the law. And although in good faith I believe I'm, I'm upholding it, but other people think I'm violating it. And then I, right, right. I take my right. chances. If it turns out that right. I succeed, everyone will regard me as a hero, and they will yeah. understand that what I did was right. But if it yeah, doesn't, well, that's my view. But, but if yeah. it doesn't, then I will be at their mercy. But the important thing about about Lincoln's but that's claim, obvious, right? Yeah, important right. thing that, about that's Lincoln's obvious. Claim. All of that, all, all of that's. I mean, you're 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 you know attributing to Lincoln and congratulating him for a certain amount of of uh, self consciousness and uh, candor, which is rare in, in in presidents. But you know, Bush is doing the same thing. I mean, you know, yeah. if you pinned him down, he'd have to admit that if in the end. 
nobody agrees with him and he's thrown in jail or his his or you know lower level executive officials are thrown in jail he's he's lost i mean he would still say that this is some kind of coup and everybody's violating the constitution but he loses if the public and the relevant people don't accept his claims and he wins if they do right. and i think he will win that is to say i think whether you call it prudential or whether you call it, you know, people in power saying, gosh, you know, maybe we do want the president to be able to do these things. Of course, maybe not these particular things, but a good president, a one we like, like Obama, mm -hmm. uh, having the authority to do these things, because maybe we think that Obama would only, you know, engage in surveillance or engage in some harsh level of, of interrogation which falls well short of torture and only the most justifiable census. And so we don't want Congress, you know, in advance on the basis of, you know, lack of information or enthusiasm or something to, to prevent that from happening, and we want him to retain the constitutional authority. Of course, he'll, you know, he'll make that argument if he has to, and he may be transparent about it or, you know, more or less transparent about it, and it might be rejected. Mm -hmm. So, Eric, let me and give I you the reasons Mary, I why think, I think you're wrong. Yeah. Let me tell you why I think you're wrong. Okay. But on those two issues, right. torture and surveillance. And they're different mm -hmm. answers. Actually, they're trying to be different, and they're interesting in terms of our views about constitutional change. On torture, mm -hmm. I think that the way in which Obama establishes the moral authority of the United States, reestablishes it, will be that he says, we do not condone torture, and we mean it this time. And he will mm -hmm. stake his public reputation on the fact that the United States does not condone torture. And so in the way in which he in exercises power, that is, increases presidential power, Right, which is what you're interested in, as, as mm -hmm. I am too, will be by saying, I, it was outrageous what they did, and we will never do it again. And what that will do is that will put the president on the side of the norm that Congress can prevent the president from torturing. Although, ironically, what that does is increases the president's moral stature in the world and therefore empowers him. So I think that's what's likely to happen politically, and then it has the effects of reinforcing the constitutional norm that I think is the right norm. That's example one. Here's example two. In example two, with surveillance, what Congress has done, in essence, by passing the FISA Amendments Act, is to give the president statutory authority to do much of what Bush sought to do before the amendments were passed. So Obama never has to say, I'm violating the statute. All he has to say is, I'm following the statute. And so what he does in that sense is, again, reassert the idea that the president is not above the law, but he gets to do everything he wants to do within the law. He, he might do that, but he might have some, he might, I mean, especially with respect to the first because of the political salience of this issue. But he might also be advised by his lawyers in the Justice Department, you know, be, be cautious about what you say. If you agree with Congress on policy, in, in, in terms of policy, then you can go ahead and obey the law, but there's no reason to give away constitutional powers yes. unnecessarily. Can I ask you a and question you, about that? You, Can I ask you a question yeah. just on that, that question? Okay. Why do you think, then, that George W. Bush, who had very good advisors, I mean, I disagree with him, but he had competent advisors, why did he repeatedly insist, we don't torture, and we would never torture, and the United States doesn't torture, when in fact, according to you, what he should have said is, well... I don't like torturing, but of course I have the power to torture if I want to. And quite frankly, I just want to tell you that I have tortured in the past, and I, I retain the power to torture again. And, and don't tell me I can't, because I need this power. Yeah, because, because you know, the word torture is a, is a complicated one, which incorporates a moral judgment. Indeed. Take, suppose he said, for example, well, yeah, we, we murdered, um, you know, that Al Qaeda op operative in Yemen or Afghanistan, and you know I'm the president, so I can murder whoever I want to. Well, he's not going to say that, yeah, but he, he has said, won't. or his flunkies have said, but why, that the U.S. But why, retains the right to, yeah. to assassinate. But why, Pardon according me? to your theory of how constitutional law changes, shouldn't he do exactly that? He should make as strong a claim as possible, stick to his guns, and then wait to see if he wins, which is, that's not quite what Bush did. It's so interesting, looking back. Mm -hmm. He did something like that in, in surveillance, but not in torture. Well, I, I mean, I think we're just disagreeing, because he has said that he, that, you know, that he's water, that they've waterboarded people and engaged in coercive interrogation. I, I'm just saying that torture has moral valence. It's, it's like saying, you know, the, the, it's like saying police are murdering people rather than killing people. Indeed, okay. but the law of the statute, so, by the way, says that you can't torture 
And the claim mm -hmm. is whether or not he violated the statute. And so the argument he consistently made was not your argument, but the first yeah, of the well, arguments, which is, he enough. said, within the, I'm within mm -hmm. the statute, and, but your argument is what he really should have done is said, I don't have to abide by that stinking statute. It's, it doesn't bind me. I'm the president. Well, yeah, because they're rhetorical as well as legal concerns that one has to keep in mind, I suppose, when, when one is president. And so instead, the argument is made at a higher level of generality. That is to say, I'm the executive. Um, I have the right to interpret narrowly, which is the lawyer's way of going about things. Right. Statutes that interfere with my ability to conduct um, a war or to protect America from a threat. Yes. Now, you know, maybe it would be better if you were more transparent, and uh, that, that's, fi that, that's fine, right? Um, but I, I think it, I th you know, but I do, but let me just say something. I do agree with you, uh, actually, about the torture issue in Obama, um, and, and it may be that uh, there will be real constitutional change there. But, but I don't think, well, you know, we'll just have to wait and see because, of course, Obama, you know, he has his own views and he's going to appoint people with strong views. Sure. But I think when he's at a higher level of generality, and I think you agree about this, I mean, I think, you know, putting aside uh, controversial issues like torture, but I think you began with this point, that, that he will want to retain a great deal of executive power. He doesn't know who's going to control Congress in two years. That's true. And he also knows, um, uh, just looking back at um, you know the Bush administration, that even when Congress is controlled by your own party, it often does things uh, that you know that get in the way get in the way of, of what you think uh, need to be done. Well, let's let's just turn this um, topic a little bit to the also interesting question of, of well, what do you think should be done? Do you think there should be trials? Um, of uh, Bush administration officials for torture and surveillance? It's a difficult question. I thought a lot about it, and I ultimately came up with the conclusion that the best balance of factors is more like a truth commission. Let me explain. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what your view on it. It's just it strikes me that if you engage in criminal prosecution of former officials, you had better be willing to devote an enormous amount of energy to that issue. And we face such enormous crises economic crisis, and, and we have two wars that are going on, and any number of difficulties, and there's going to be a big fight over the health care system. The amount of energy that would be sapped by criminal prosecutions of former Bush administration officials is just un unimaginable. It would destroy any chance of partisan, uh, bipartisanship and cooperation in doing anything. Uh, that's the reason why I think Obama is going to shy away uh, as much as possible from using the criminal process. But of course, there's also a very strong interest on the part of his supporters in getting to the bottom of what happened, finding mm -hmm. out, you know, the, the OLC memos that authorize certain activities. A lot of people want to know, what were those OLC memos that were secret? And, and what actually did people do? And what, what did the president authorize? So I think there'll be pressure on the other side for a sort of truth commission, which, without bringing criminal charges, uh, tries to get to the bottom of what happened. And that, of course, will take up a lot of... Uh, of uh, energy too, but I don't think quite as much as criminal prosecutions. Now, do you do you mean a South Africa style truth commission where um, you essentially get amnesty on condition that you uh, that you actually tell the truth, or do you think or do you, are you thinking of something more modest than that? Uh, I actually don't know the answer to this question. You can obviously we can talk about the pros and cons of the South African model. Um, one of the, you know, the South African model, one argument for that is that it actually induces people to say things they wouldn't otherwise say because of amnesty. Right. Um, because a, a truth commission might not work if people are not cooperative. The way, you know, David Addington in front of Congress it was not terribly um, informative, and one suspects he wouldn't be in front of a truth commission either. I, I suspect there are some people that it doesn't matter whether you give them amnesty or not. It's not going to... Mm -hmm. It's not going to really change the way that they talk about things. I suspect that um, there are arguments, by the way, for not doing the South Africa model. With, with a character like Addington, maybe the only thing you can do is put him on uh, before a, uh, uh, put him under oath and, and have him talk. And then, of course, he's mm -hmm. got the, the issues of, of the Fifth Amendment, and he also has the perjury problem. And maybe that's the right way to deal with it. But I just want to tell you that. It, you have to decide at the very beginning what is it you want. Do you want to find out what happened, or do you want to punish people? 
If you want to find out what happened, you adopt a very different set of strategies in different institutions. If you want to find out, if you want to pun just punish people, well, you got to choose a very different set of, of ideas and, and strategies institutions. And that's what Obama has to decide very early on. The third no, alternative, by the way, is don't, hmm. let's not, I don't want to know anything. I don't know what, right. I don't want to know what happened. I just want to move on. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, in my view, uh, this maybe has to do with my views about politics generally. It's better to find out what happened. Uh, less important to actually put people in jail. And the worst choice is, is just sweeping it all under the rug. I don't know how you would, how you would choose among those three categories. Well, it's hard. I mean, you know, I'm not sure I, I buy into the whole premise uh, about the importance of um, of this. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's not sure. It's not clear to me how much we don't know, and there've been a lot of investigations going on. But let's put let's put that all aside and treat this as on par with um, the types of transitional problems that other countries have faced. Right. And as you've mentioned already, and I'm sure this was in the back of your mind as you were speaking. There have been, you know, there have been, there are two extremes. One is to sweep it under the rug. That's the Spanish model. The other extreme is to have, um, you know, trials. That was the U.S. model in Germany. That tends to be a, a, an approach that one takes when you're in occupying power. Yeah. And then there's, there are various middle, there are various middle uh, approaches, such as having truth commissions. And, uh, and I've looked at this before. I, I've been interested in this topic for a while, and I've written a little bit about it. And I, I guess, and this may just reflect my political biases, but my, my sense is that um, uh, the Spanish model has always been uh, most impressive because, the, 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 well, it depends. Okay, so it depends on something. So, and this is the key premise. Is the, is the question whether they you know, clearly acted illegally and, you know, more or less everybody would agree about it, and it's just a question of, for political and prudential purposes, uh, moving on. Mm -hmm. Or is it quite really a controversy about whether they acted illegally in the first place? Yeah. And, and this gets back to my earlier point about how one interprets the Constitution and the President's power to uh, take actions in, in violations of statutes to, uh, to uh, address emergencies. And, uh, and basically, in all these transitional countries, you have the same problems. Is it an ideological disagreement? Some people think the past was okay. Some people think it was terrible. Mm -hmm. Or is it just basically a, a criminal problem? Mm -hmm. To the extent this is really an ideological problem, you know, I mean, it would be interesting to have the trials and see what would happen. There could be a tremendous public backlash to them with the result that the Bush administration views of presidential power would, would, be, would be entrenched. Right. They would, you know... The other possibility is that everybody would think this is terrific, in which case the Bush views would be repudiated quite dramatically in a sort of Nuremberg-style style way. My guess, and, and I think we might agree about this, is that, well, my guess is that, it, that, it would, that there wouldn't be much resolution. That is, there would be a tremendous amount of ideological disagreement with the result that these trials would be tainted forever. That is to say... Half the country or whatever, 40 percent, a non-trivial minority of the country would say these were political trials brought by the enemies of the Bush administration and Republicans in general. These are the truth commissions or the criminal trials? Trials. Uh, I'm sorry. But the same criminal thing can, trials. Criminal trials, yeah. Criminal trials. But the same thing would be said about truth commissions and, of course, are said about truth commissions. That yeah. is to say that if the, the views of, of, the, of the Bush administration actually do have a widespread um, a widespread resonance among Americans, non-trivial, not necessarily a majority, but non-trivial, mm -hmm. then those people re will regard either criminal trials as political trials or truth commissions as basically political trials designed to humiliate people. And the result is we're not going to have a constitutional settlement uh, of the type that you might like or uh, Obama's supporters might like. What we would just have is a, is a constitutional disagreement that would uh, persist uh, for quite some time until, you know, the Obama administration does something, you know, either endorses the, yeah. the Bush view or in some fundamental way repudiates. So I'll make a prediction, and I, it's always terrible making predictions, but I want to draw an analogy to the Cold War. And in the United States, there was a dispute over segregation and whether or not uh, segregation was wrong, unconstitutional, and evil. And eventually it was resolved through the, the second reconstruction of the civil rights movement. But in that period, the Cold War played an enormously important role uh, because the United States not only had to worry about making everybody happy within its borders, 
but it also had to worry about what it was doing looked like in the world of the Cold War. And I think that you know, America's position in the world, its position as a superpower and struggle with the Russians, had an important tipping function, tipping point function, in basically causing segregation to be regarded as, in hindsight, having always been wrong. When it wasn't always regarded as wrong, and as you well know, I mean, there were people on both sides of the issue, and they really disagreed heatedly. So here's my prediction. It may be wrong, but I wonder what you think about it. Uh, foreign policy concerns about America's place in the world and the image of the United States in the world and our moral leadership in the world and our, our, our status as a democracy that promotes human rights are very much up in the air now. They've been damaged or tarnished by the Bush administration. Whether Americans think that, it's certainly true in the other parts of the world. That, I think, is going to be the tipping uh, phenomenon that shapes the, the meaning, if you will, of the Bush administration. It will be foreign policy issues and what America wants to do in the future and how it wants to be regarded that will shape how Americans ultimately think of the last eight years. What do you think of that? Well, I think foreign policy is a relevant consideration and America's standing in the world is important. But, you know, the Cold War was a, t was a time of tremendous, quite, you know, horrible compromises. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, even as race relations were improving in the United States, the United States government was toppling, you know, foreign, foreign governments and supporting um, rebels in Nicaragua and doing, you know, all in Vietnam War, you know, all kinds of horrible Indeed. things Indeed. that it thought was in its interest. I'm very glad, by the so, way, that you and I agree that the United States did a lot of terrible things during the Cold War because another version of Eric Poster might say, no, it was all necessary. We all had to do it. Well, I'm not as much of a monster as you think I am. I, no, I, I never I, I thought think... that. But I was thinking about, I'm thinking about the Eric Posner in 19, uh, 1958 and I having a debate. And, and the Eric Posner in 1958 might say, look, you know, you may not like it, Jack, but, you know, you've got to do this. We've got to beat the Riskies. So um, in any case. I think I was, wasn't I saying, I mean, I think, yes, I think, well, yeah, I mean, all right, wait a second. Maybe, maybe I'm a monster after all. Oh, I mean, no. I think. No, 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 no. I think that the, the. Look, I think that we have exa it's exactly the same situation as the Cold War. Yeah. That is to say, the, That's the United why I was surprised. States... United... That's why I was surprised. Yeah. Right? It looked very okay. similar to me. All right, all right. So we're in exactly the same situation. The United States is a powerful country mm -hmm. that, um, that you know, protects itself first and foremost, mm -hmm. and in the process occasionally acts in the interest of other countries as well, which look to it for protection right. and return right. for certain things. Okay. So, so in the course of protecting itself, it does things that seem, on the basis of common sense morality, quite terrible. Yes. Now, in some cases, they are quite terrible and unnecessary. But in other cases, at least from an ex-ante perspective, at the time that the decision is being made, it seems like a reasonable trade-off. You know, mm -hmm. we support the Shah of Iran. He's a terrible guy. Right. If we don't, you know, the Soviet Union will dominate the Persian Gulf. Or, of course, nobody really predicted this. You know, you get a theocracy in Iran, which is in right. some respects even worse. All right. So there are these horrible. So so all right. So you know what I'm going to say. So the so now we we have the same sort of situation. The Bush administration, I think, made reasonable judgments, which in in retrospect turned out to be wrong. Mm -hmm. Some of them were, some of them were. I don't know whether they're right or wrong. Things like surveillance and so forth. Torture. I think they were probably right. Torture is much harder. Torture is much harder. So the, the Bush administration decided to um, torture people, basically, mm -hmm. to get information at a time of massive uncertainty. At the time, I think it was probably, well, of course, it depends on the circumstances, but at least in some of the circumstances, it may well have been a reasonable judgment to make. Mm -hmm. It's really actually, if you're just looking at it from this perspective, this instrumental perspective, it's just very hard to know one way or the other. Yeah. I do agree with, I do think that with the benefit of hindsight, it was clearly a mistake. Well, which, was, probably, which was a mistake? torturing people and, and that sort of stuff. I think that was a mistake because it hurt the United States in ways that were much more significant than uh, the ways that it benefited people. But remember, the, you know, the Europeans were involved in this also uh, in terms of uh, renditions and so forth. They thought this stuff was necessary. They didn't want their publics to know, but at least the governments were, all these governments were making the same calculation. Right. If we don't deal with these people harshly, Paris, London, Manhattan are going to go up in a mushroom cloud. Well, the more liberal people uh, so who made I, these so decisions. I need to ask you. I understand where you're sitting yeah. on this now, because it looks to me now like you're kind of agreeing with my view that the meaning of the Bush years 
in hindsight will be determined by whether or not people in hindsight think that torture was morally wrong and unnecessary. Well, I don't think torture alone, but I think maybe maybe torture will stand out as, you know, because of its special... Or, or Gitmo. Uh, Guantanamo will stand out as a symbol of what went wrong during Guantanamo. the last eight years. I, mean, I think Guantanamo is ridiculous. I mean, I think Guantanamo is ridiculous. That is sort of a purely symbolic thing. The, the, the torture, I, I very much understand, what, what, you know, why people would seize upon that. Guantanamo seems to me, well, look, they're going to they're gonna hold these people somewhere. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there are camps in Iraq and Afghanistan already where they hold people. Yeah. Nobody cares about that. Yeah. I've never really, I mean, I understand as a matter of political symbolism, Guantanamo is, is a big problem and has to be shot. But um, it strikes me that from a moral perspective, Guantanamo, that is the decision to detain people for a lengthy period of time because they're dangerous, but you cannot charge them uh, and you cannot try them, mm-hmm. that is a much more difficult moral judgment uh, than torture is. Yeah. I just want to, can we oh, focus on Gitmo yeah. for a second? I want to go back okay. to your idea that you've raised, which is the idea that the the moral judgment, or rather the constitutional judgment of later years, is going to be shaped by how the politics plays out. And mm-hmm. I kind of agree with that, except that I'm making a prediction that people will be people will be uh, think torture is abhorrent. More people will think it's abhorrent now in the new administration, and in, because of foreign policy considerations, for the same reasons, Gitmo will be a symbol of bad policies and unjust policies, whether you not think that's hypocritical because of other things that we're doing. And that in turn, that in turn will change the constitutional understandings. And surveillance might also, people will say in hindsight, you know, the president really should have gone to Congress and gotten authority, and he didn't. Um, so all of those examples seem to suggest that the politics is influencing constitutional law in a way that will render what the Bush administration did as not constitutional. Uh, well, not right, right, right. I, I agree with you on, a, on, a, on the methodological point about mm-hmm. the influence of politics, but my, my prediction is less sunny than yours because I, 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 don't think, I don't think things will work out that way because I think the world is becoming more dangerous rather than less dangerous. Right, and as it becomes and more just, dangerous... As it becomes, as it becomes more, becomes, da- more dangerous. And this is your own work, right? As, as it becomes more dangerous, I don't mean Al-Qaeda. I really mean yeah. the you know weapon, the weapons of mass destruction becoming more and more available yes. and transportable yes. and so forth. Yes. And people, people will, will increasingly say, you know, surveillance, that, that makes sense. Uh, detaining dangerous people, well, they do it in France, you know. Mm-hmm. Things seem fine in France. Right. Um, they certainly they engage in a lot of surveillance, in France. And, and in other countries as well. I, I, that is what I think will happen in the future. I think torture. You're right about. Uh, you know, I guess my guess, which is pretty much worthless. But if I had to make a prediction, I think that torture will continue to occur only in very limited, secretive ways. There won't be a systematic uh, mm-hmm. uh, government policy. It may occasionally. I mean, if you just look at the history of the United States, torture has been going on for a very long time, mm-hmm. you know, by the CIA. And the CIA has been doing all kinds of horrible things for a very long time because, you know, more or less intelligent people thought this made sense in the circumstances. I simply don't see that changing. But I do see that, I do agree with you that it's not going to be part of our sort of official, you know, constitution or constitutional policy and, and presidents are not going to be endorsing it. As, although, as you mentioned, Bush didn't really endorse this a lot of this stuff so much as try to, you know, try to hedge around it. Right. But, uh, but, but for the reasons you've given in your own work, you know, that surveillance is becoming a more and more important tool of government policy. That's how government governs now, yeah. It has to. Mm-hmm. And, and, people are, and people are going to acquiesce because the alternative to, uh, to surveillance by the government is danger that people don't want to put up with. So, so I see Obama administration or the next, you know, administration after it, Democratic or Republican, gradually over the years acknowledging, uh, either enthusiastically or reluctantly, changes in our Constitution which give the government, especially the president, more power and, and limit and limits civil liberties. Now, if there's another big terrorist attack that destroys a, a city, the Bush administration will look better, mm-hmm. uh, and, the, and his constitutional claims will look, you know, more plausible. Right. If that doesn't happen for quite a, a long time, it'll look terrible, and it'll be a symbol of uh, tyranny that will be used as a kind of... Uh, but but I, I think there's going to be a lot of pro, a lot of trouble as people in the future 
try both to justify increased government surveillance and searching and detentions and so forth while distancing themselves from the from the Bush administration's approach because I think, you know, the government's going to have to do this and that people will support it. I, I It's interesting because I think that my reading of history is that when governments try to do things that are, that look dicey, they have no trouble distinguishing the dicey things they're doing in the present from the dicey things that people did in the past. They have no problem. They say, oh, well, this isn't Korematsu. It's not like we're rounding up all the Japanese-American citizens and putting them in, in internment camps. This is, this is far different. So I think that the, mm-hmm. the, the folks in the future will say, well, this wasn't the Bush administration after all. I mean, we, were, you know, we didn't have that crazy Dick Cheney running around doing things. Well, what we're doing is very different. So I, I'm not quite sure about that. But well, this, this that, is what... Well, as a matter of rhetoric, you're, you're, you're clearly right. It's just the law professors saying, hey, you know, your implicit theory of executive power is really not that different from uh, the Bush administrations, mm-hmm. and, you know, presumably no one will pay attention to that, but, but yes, in terms of... <laughs> well, that's of our job. Rhetoric, no one pays attention no to us, yeah. Yes, in that's any why case, we're here. In any case, we will see what happens. Uh, we'll probably have another one of these in five years or ten years, and then you'll tell me that I was completely wrong. But uh, No, 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 vice versa. I'm sure. Anyway, thanks very much. It was a pleasure talking to you. Okay, my pleasure, Jay. Bye-bye. Bye.